In just a moment, biographies and sound, but first... Boy, that kind of music went out with a handlebar mustache, didn't it? But the kind of wonderful melodies you'll hear on NBC's bandstand are guaranteed to remain popular throughout the years. This is Bert Parks, your bandstand MC. I'd like to invite you to spend two full hours each weekday morning with America's top name bands. Groups like Guy Lombardo, the Dorsey Brothers, and Ralph Flanagan. They'll entertain you in person. So listen Monday through Friday to NBC Bandstand. And now, stay tuned for Biographies and Sound on NBC. Transcribed. He was interested in us, not only as football players, but also as men. Rock never forgot his athletes after they departed from the school. And that, to me, is a sign of a great football coach. He also had one other great ability. He could really fire a team up to where it would sure go to town. He was probably the softest touch. He was the softest touch that I ever knew. I always had time for a person. Rock was gone, and with him had gone a part of every life his had touched. In 1893, an emigrant family left the little mountain town of Voss in Norway and moved to Chicago. There was the father and mother, three daughters, and a five-year-old boy named Knut Rockney, who later was more often called Newt, Newt Rockney. That boy became one of the most famous figures of his time, and he left a legend and a tradition that lives on even 25 years after his death in 1931. This is a biography in sound. They knew Rockney, an impression of an unforgettable personality created by the voices of those who knew him. <laughs> During the 1920s, that period often called the golden age of sports, the name Rockney of Notre Dame was as well known as that of any figure in public life, and yet he was merely a football coach, a football coach at a comparatively small school, the University of Notre Dame at South Bend, Indiana. But the play of his teams and his own personality captured the imagination of an entire country. He produced more championship teams and all-American players than any man of his generation, yet that isn't why he's still so well remembered after a quarter of a century. He's remembered because of the sort of person he was. The echoes of the bands playing, the cheers of the crowds have died away. But the memory of this short, stocky, bald-headed Scandinavian remains bright and clear. Well, as a neighbor knew Rock, New York Rock, as we always called him, was... And as his friends and neighbors called him, was a true neighbor in every sense of the word. I, uh, I truly remember Rock as uh, a tremendous person, great uh, personality, a uh, very uh, tremendous sense of humor, always ready with a quick quip, and never the, never the loss for the right thing at the right time. I remember when we were bowling at the Elks. He was on my team. I'd go down and miss the head pin. He'd yell out, ball one, and uh, eternally... That type of person. Of course, many people wonder uh, Rock's uh, attitude, uh, reaction after a football game. I've been asked countless times whether he was high in victory and low and depressed in defeat. That is not true. He uh, loved to win, as we all do, but took his defeats in stride. 
This is Tom Hickey of South Bend, who was a friend and neighbor of Newt Rockney and his family for years. Rockney is remembered partly through the stories that are told and retold when his friends gather. I remember I was out there one afternoon, and uh, Rock had an Irish guard that uh, pulled more bloopers than uh, he normally would excuse, so he finally teed off on this guard. This guard would pull out when he should stay in and stay in when he should pull out, and finally Rock climbed all over him, and he said, you are positively the dumbest Irishman I've ever seen in my life. Can you tell me anything or anybody that's dumber than a dumb Irishman? The kid looked back and grinned. He said, sure, Rock, a smart Swede. Rockney grew up in a middle-class suburb of Chicago. He took part in all sports, but it was only after a hard struggle that he made his high school team. He didn't finish high school, but an older sister still insisted that he go to college. That seemed like an almost impossible dream, and he worked four years in the post office until he saved up enough money. He had planned to go to the University of Illinois, but a friend talked him into going with him to Notre Dame. It was a Catholic school, of course, and although he wasn't then a member of the church, he learned to love the school and its campus. I expect I knew Rock as well as anybody in the United States except possibly his lovely wife. He was captain of my 1913 team, then he was my assistant in football from 13 to 18 and head coach of track. This is Jess Harper, who now lives on a ranch near Sitka, Kansas. Looking back over more than 40 years, he recalls when he was athletic director at Notre Dame and Newt Rockney's football coach. The point I want to bring out that so often we think of men that are great like Rock was that he always was great. Rock was not. He made himself. He came to Notre Dame as a freshman and only weighed 135 pounds. He was a plunging fullback on his high school team in Chicago. He, uh, by hard work, developed himself into one of the greatest stands that I ever saw play, even though he only weighed 156 pounds. He still could play in on any of the ball clubs that are playing today. Yes, Rockney was a football coach, but something more than that. Part of that something more was rare determination. In track, when he came to Notre Dame as a, as a pole vaulter, he could vault 10 feet. In his senior year, he went over 12 feet and for a short time held the world's indoor record. When Rockney took over as head football coach in 1918, he succeeded a man whose teams had attracted national attention. But it was Rockney and his fighting Irish teams that made Notre Dame famous on the gridiron. We had a very good football field, a very good turf, but we only had a seating capacity of about 3,000 people. And about half of that was made up of tempor temporary bleachers. Compared to the day with their fine stadium, that seats 57,000 people. It was in 1913, as a player under Jess Harper, that Rockney helped to make football history. He was an end, and along with Gus Doré, the quarterback, he helped develop the forward pass in a way that revolutionized football. There's been lots of stories about that uh, summer practice on forward passing. The truth of it was that Rock had always caught the ball in his stomach. And I told him he had to learn to catch it in his hands. So he and Gus DeRay, our great quarterback, went down to Cedar Point, took a football with them, and practiced the art of catching the ball in their hands, which proved out so successfully in the Army game. In that game, uh, the half ended 14 to 13. Between halves, I said to Doray, you've got to go throw on that ball because they're playing an old style of defense. Backs up close. And he said, I've tried two and they didn't go. Well, I said, just keep throwing. He went back there and completed 13 straight forward passes. Notre Dame won that game over a powerful Army team, 35 to 13. Later, as a coach, Rockney made many other changes that helped to make football a faster, more exciting game. Along with his other abilities, he was a student of the game. Yes, Rockney had something extra, something special, something that perhaps no other coaches had to the same degree. He was a wonderful teacher. 
he went into every detail and he had the ability to teach the boys on the field to do what he wanted them to do in exactly the way he wanted it done. He also had one other great ability to instill a boy to play way over his head. He could really fire a team up to where it would sure go to town. Yes, Rockney could really charge a team up so it would be sure to go to town. His pep talks in the dressing room before games and at halftime were legendary, along with the psychological tricks he pulled. He himself was sentimental, and he didn't mind using any emotional appeal he could think of. His players admired and liked to mimic him. One of these was Jack Cannon, an All-American guard on several of the greatest Notre Dame teams in the late 1920s. An all-time All-American, he's now a businessman in Columbus, Ohio. The most uh, unusual game that we played for Rock, I'll never will forget it, and that was the Army game in 1929. And I'll uh, give you a scene of uh, what Rock brought out. We left Rockney back at South Bend because he had this fembitis trouble. And uh, if you recall back in 29, he was a pretty sick man. So we didn't see Rock all the time we were in New York. And uh, so the telephone rang. For some reason, we have never seen a telephone in a dressing room. But Hunk Anderson answered the phone, and he said, It's Rock from South Bend. And uh, Rock was talking to each and every one of us on this long-distance telephone call, which we thought. And uh, we said, Yes, sir, we'll do the best we can, Mr. Rockney. Okay, yes, sir, yes, sir. And he gave us our plays and things of that nature. Well, by goodness alive, we got out there in the field, and the first uh, quarter... Nothing to nothing. Second quarter, nothing to nothing. And we came in with our heads pretty well down. Everything was very quiet in the room. And uh, the door opens up and they wheel Rock in. It was electrifying to us. And there Rock was in the uh, wheelchair with his leg propped up. And uh, his hat was down over his head. He had a cigar in his hand and a handkerchief in another. Now, imagine that I am Rockney. Well, men, here I am. Yes, I called to you from now then. I was worried. They flew me up here against the doctor's wishes. I've tried everything I possibly could to instill this football game in your minds. And yet, you've gone out. And what have you done? Just think, just think. 30 minutes have gone, this ball game. And you want to become national champions. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. I've never asked too much of you. But this I do. I want this ball game. I've tried, I've tried, I've tried awfully hard all season long. And now, now the time has come where I'm in this wheelchair. And when the doctor told me it would be either life or death for me, I can't carry it on, boys. It's too much of a strain. Too much. I've never asked for anything yet. But I'm asking for this one particular game. And boys, if you can just win this ball game and give it to me, I'll be the most pleased coach in America. Now, I've never said this to anybody before, but I'm telling you, men, the doctor mentioned before I came into this dressing room, Rock, this is your last ball game. Your heart can't stand it. And boys, I'm asking of you. I'm turning in my resignation. And with that resignation, I hope that I might have this victory. This victory from you. Boys, the best of wishes to you now. I know, I know. I know that you'll go out and do the best. And with that, we went out that door so fast. There was an officer standing in front, and I think he went 15 feet. And uh, we played that ball game, Nick and Tuck, to the last, I think it was uh, a minute and two seconds. And Kegel was throwing a pass to Morrell. 
and the ball came down to around about the 15-yard line, and Jack Elder came and played out of position. He intercepted the ball, and he ran the complete end of the field around, and I think it was around 98 yards for a touchdown. We missed the goal, and it was six to nothing. And the game was over. And we came in, and there was old Rock, and he was standing this time. And uh, lo and behold, uh, he was shaking hands. And he says, well, boys, he said, we certainly enjoyed that game, didn't we? We got it on ice now, and I want to thank you all. Now, next season, I'll tell you what we're going to start off with. We're going to start off with the shifting ends, and we're going to have these weaving backs. Now, uh, you boys that's graduating, I want to congratulate you. Uh, meet me up at the hotel, and uh, we'll have a nice dinner. Get on the train. Come on back south then. All you boys now, uh, you can turn in your suits to the managers. I don't want you to steal anything because it costs money. All right, boys, thanks again, and I'll be seeing you this spring practice. He was an actor who played many parts, but underneath, he was always Rockney, a loyal leader who wanted you to do your best, a deeply human person in spite of his fame. He coaxed, scolded, drove, and inspired. His teams, with the famous Notre Dame shift that he devised, played like machines, but each player remained an individual. In the fall of 1926, Joe Boland who's now a sportscaster in South Bend, known as the voice of Notre Dame, was playing his final season. The second game of that season was the Minnesota game at Minneapolis. On the second play of that game, Joe Boland broke through the line to block a kick when an opposing player blocked him. His legs snapped. He crumpled to the ground and was carried off the field in a stretcher. Notre Dame won, but that night Joe Boland was in a hospital in a strange town coming out of the ether. You don't converse easily when you're fresh out of the anesthetic and can feel a four-foot-long cast around one leg. You don't feel very good about being hundreds of miles from home in a strange city facing a long period of convalescence without the teammates you know must depart by special train at midnight. But there's Rock sitting in the chair telling you how much he's depended on you, how well you've done for him as football player and friend, how much he thinks of you and how he'll miss you in the weeks to come. He goes on to cheer you up to take your mind off the throbbing pain, off the disappointment of a lost senior season, and all further eligibility along with the dream of All-America selection, now shattered, off the self-pity that tries to pry its way into your subconscious. And as you know, as you listen to Rockney, this man isn't just a football coach. He's something special. A different kind of man, even than the remarkable personality you had always known him to be. Somehow, that cast seems like a medal, and the pain a privilege. In a few short weeks, you'll be back on that campus, back with your teammates, back with the man now sitting in the shadows of that hospital room, whose presence through those hours of a heartbreaking Saturday night, I'll never forget. The boys would do anything for him. They idolized him, even in life. Because he was, he, he, he was just a fine person. This is Mrs. H. Watts Eicher, now of Washington, D.C. As Ruth Faulkner, before her marriage, she was Newt Rockne's secretary from 1925 until his death in 1931. And she recalls how she felt when she first met him. It was a pretty awe-inspiring experience for a young girl. I was pretty terrified because I'd heard so much about him. And what a, an important person he was. The driving energy of Newt Rockney was demonstrated by the schedule of his working day. During a football season, a typical morning would be to start to take dictation. And uh, there would probably be um, 15 or 20 interruptions with people coming to see him and telephone calls. So there would, wouldn't be much work there. And at uh, noontime, uh, he always had a f lecture. Uh, the boys got the football team together and had a lecture, noontime. And he'd come back in the afternoon hoping to get to his dictation. And uh, there would be the same thing. There'd be students, outside people, officials. Of course, he had the administrative work of the, of the uh, athletic association to handle. And, of course, 3 o'clock when school was out, he went out on the field. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was always an accumulation of things to be done. And football season uh, in the evening is when we got our dictation done. And yet, in spite of his busy schedule, there's something else that Mrs. Iker remembers most about Rockney. I always had time for a person. 
And perfect strangers would come in the office. He had time for them. Because he figured if they had taken the time to bother to drive maybe 500 miles or 200 miles to come out there to pay their respects to him, he owed them the courtesy. This is Kenneth Banghart, and this biography and sound, They Knew Rockney, will continue after a pause for station identification. This is a biography in sound, They Knew Rockney, an impression of Newt Rockney created by the voices of those who knew him. After Rockney was graduated from Notre Dame, he became a chemistry instructor and assistant football coach. He stayed partly because he had met and married Bonnie Skiles, with whom he shared the rest of the years of his life, along with a growing family, and partly because he loved the thrills and excitement of those golden Saturday afternoons in autumn. In the early 1920s, Rockney and Notre Dame went on to the years of their greatest triumphs, led by the most famous backfield of all time, the Four Horsemen. Jimmy Crowley was at left halfback, Elmer Layden at fullback, and Don Miller at right half. And by the way, we got that name by given us by Grantland Rice, and it came in his write-up of our game with Army in New York in October 1924. He started out his lead by saying, outlined against a blue-gray October sky, the Four Horsemen rode again. This is Harry Stuhldreyer, the quarterback of the Four Horsemen, and now an industrial executive in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. You know, Rock always worked on the theory that if he couldn't do a good enough coaching job during the week, he didn't deserve to be coaching. Now, he spent a lot of time with quarterbacks. That's why it was a rare privilege for me to have known and worked with him, because we spent a lot of time together. And he would go over the game so thoroughly that the game was in our hands when we were on the field. As you recall, and so will a lot of the old-timers, we used the direct system of calling play. There was no huddle, and we had to stand up and call them as we saw them. But with such a good background, and a good rehearsal beforehand of the opponent, the opponent's weaknesses and developments as the game went on, you couldn't miss. On the most part, we were on our own, and it was a great training. Every former Notre Dame player has one favorite story about Rockney. This is one that Harry Stuhldreyer tells. In 1923, when we played Princeton, as a matter of fact, that was the first time Notre Dame had ever played Princeton. And it was the week after our Army game in New York, and Princeton had an awfully good ball club. Rock was most anxious to not only make a good showing against Princeton, but to beat them. Down at Pal outside of Palmer Stadium, they had, uh, oh, uh, not a makeshift, but not too sturdily built, locker room. And in this locker house, there were only two rooms, one for Princeton and one for uh, the visiting team. Just as Rock was a ready to go to work and give us a charge, a pep talk, before this game in this big intersectional battle. Bill Roper, who was a coach at Princeton, and a great psychologist, and a great talker, went to work on his Princeton squad. Went on to say that these so-called hayshakers out of the Middle West were coming down into the up East mm -hmm. to uh, show us how to play football. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to pull anything on us. We'll show them how this game is to be played. And all that business went on in that Vain. And when, Ro when Roper completed this wonderful charge to his team, Rock just turned to us and said, there you are, fellas. And we went out and played the game on Bill Roper's pep talk. To those who lived through them, the years of the Four Horsemen were probably the most memorable, even though there have been many other great Notre Dame teams. Certainly the team of the Four Horsemen and the Seven Mules, as the line was called, was the greatest up until that time. But as they look back over more than 30 years to their playing days with Rockney, they remember something more than the newspaper headlines, the exciting trips, and the victories. Rock had the unusual uh, ability, I would say, to, to know a boy. There were many boys that he would never say a word to and get the most out of. Other boys he would encourage, and other boys he would be on all the time to get the most out of. And it would only take Rock about two weeks to find out what type of a boy he had to deal with. But there's one night, one great thing about Rock. Rock never forgot his athletes after they departed from the school. And that, that, to me, is a sign of a great football coach. This is Donald C. Miller, the right halfback of the Four Horsemen, now an attorney in Cleveland, Ohio. 
But all through that time, he got the spirit of Notre Dame that's on the campus. There's no difference between a freshman and a senior. There's no difference between a wealthy boy and a poor boy. And they're all, as you know, there's all nationalities. It's getting so you, you can't have an Irish name to play on Notre Dame anymore. But <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's true that you get a certain spirit down there that you, you find in very few campuses throughout the United States. And I say at Notre Dame, there is a, a chance for a, a boy. It's an all-boys school for a boy to get that spirit of Notre Dame. And it's truly a great spirit because afterwards, it's just like one big fraternity. They all stick together pretty well the rest of their life. Rockney left behind a great deal more than a remarkable record of victories and championships. All over the country, there are successful men in all walks of life who feel they owe their success partly to Rockney. Well, I think anyone that ever played under Rock has the uh, spirit of aggressiveness and sincerity, and and I believe that um, the majority of his men have been more or less successful throughout the, the country over the period of years that played under Rock. He, he certainly left a... A great impression on each man that ever was on that squad, that ever was under him. Elmer Layden, the fullback of the Four Horsemen team for three years, later became coach at Notre Dame, and he's now a business executive in Chicago. I remember Rock best, of course, uh, uh, in the aftermath, and um, he was interested in us, not only as football players, but also as men. I think he uh, gave to me uh, more than I can ever repay because uh, he was not only a coach, he was a friend. I remember him particularly because uh, one day he was down at one end of the field working with the line, and we were running signals as a backfield, and he called uh, to us and something we were doing because we weren't putting all of our best efforts. And... Um, we thought he had eyes in the back of his head. Jim Crowley, who was known as Sleepy Jim in his playing days, was the left halfback of the Four Horsemen and is now a radio and television executive in Scranton, Pennsylvania. A Rockney was a highly intelligent man. A very few people know it, but he was a professor of chemistry there from 1914 till about 1920. Boys who took chemistry from him have told me that he was one of the greatest professors that they came in contact with during their four years there. He had a dynamic personality. He was a hard-driving coach, very aggressive. But he kindled this aggressiveness with human kindness. If you had a sprained ankle, it was Rockney who taped your ankle. If you had an infected hand, it was Rockney who got a bucket of hot water. And it was Rockney who grabbed you by the wrist and dunked your hand and held it into the hot water. On the trips, it was Rockney who carried the keys to the trunks, and it was Rockney who doled out the sweatshirts, the sweat socks, etc. He was at once your dad, your pal, your friend, advisor, and coach. Rockney was a great dressing room psychologist, and the two factors that made him a great dressing room psychologist, in my opinion, were these. First, he was a great orator, and secondly, he was a marvelous actor. Yes, a great actor. He could get a lump in his throat and his, could make his lips tremble at the proper time. Let me give you a little example. In 1922, our team was decimated by graduation. We had nine sophomores on the first team. In fact, we were so young-looking that one sports writer said that he bet there weren't two safety razors in all that luggage that we had. We went down to play a great Georgia Tech team who hadn't been defeated on their home field in nine years. We were to be defeated by 35 points because of our inexperience. It was our first big game. We were boys just out of high school. But Rockney came into that dressing room before game time and he had a great number of telegrams in his right hand. He said they were from prominent alumni. In his left hand, he held a lone wire. He said it was from his poor sick a little boy, Billy, who was critically ill back in the hospital in South Bend. And then he read the wire. The lips began to tremble. A lump came to his throat. He says, I want Daddy's team to win. Well, we love Rockney so much that we didn't let him finish his talk. We knocked him down. We went through a bolted door. We got out into the field ten minutes before game time, waiting for Georgia Tech to give us this terrific licking, which they did. We made 20 goal line stands that afternoon, but we took a terrific 
physical beating from this heavier, older Georgia Tech team. But we won the game 13-3. to I remember going to the depot that night from the hotel we were, where we stayed. We looked like an Elks parade because we walked down the middle of the street. And the reason we walked down the middle of the street was because of these terrific Charlie horses we had. We couldn't step up and down off the curbings. We had a terrible train ride back to South Bend. We couldn't sleep, and they switched cars at every station. And when we got back to South Bend the next morning, because of this wonderful, terrific, upset victory of ours, there were 10,000 people there at the depot ready to greet us. And as we stepped down the long steps of the train, with our faces racked in pain, whom do you think was the first one we saw in the front lines? You're absolutely correct. It was that poor, sick little boy, Billy, looking like an ad for some breakfast food, and we were all basket cases. Not all of Rockney's friends were great athletic stars. He liked and helped boys for what they were, not for the use he might make of their athletic ability. Patrick Canney, now an attorney for a railroad in Cleveland, was just a boy who wanted an education. Newt Rockney encouraged him to go to Notre Dame and gave him a job as custodian of athletic equipment. He was with Rockney on the great teams of the middle 1920s. He had the quickest brain, I think, of any man I ever saw. And I've, I've been trying law schools for 25 years. And he was good in anything he undertook. It wasn't just uh, football. Uh, it was uh, speech making. For instance, uh, before he became a coach, he stuttered a little bit. He couldn't speak. Uh, nobody listened to him. He'd put you to sleep. But he worked hard and studied hard himself and learned to be a great orator. And on the field, he was a great man for detail. I've seen it when I was out there. We'd have four scrimmages going on at the same time. I mean, that'd be eight teams. So in the, in the four corners of the field, we had a big practice field then, bigger than it is now. And he'd stand in sort of the center and watch, say, teams A and B playing down in the northeast corner. And he would watch a play and pick out four or five defects of four different players. In just one play, that would be over. And he'd turn his head around, and he'd see the fellows in the other corner. He'd watch a play, and he'd pick out three or four there. And the same thing in the, with the teams on the south end of the field. I've seen him call these teams out for practice. And he would start at the center. And just he'd pick these boys by name, either their first name or their last name. He'd go center, right guard, left guard, right tackle, left tackle, right end, left end, quarterback, fullback, left half and right, and never make a mistake in six teams. Donald M. Hamilton, now a lawyer in Columbus, Ohio, was a football player at Notre Dame during Newt Rockney's college days. As an undergraduate, he was also an assistant coach in 1912, some 44 years ago, and remembers Rockney throughout his career. They report that one time after he'd lost a ball game, they were on a train going someplace. And for the purpose of instilling a little more Notre Dame spirit into these players, they he put up a photograph of each man's opponent in the berth so that that fellow could look at him. The last thing before he went to sleep, and the first thing when he woke up in the morning. During his last two years as a coach, 1929 and 1930, Rockney's teams were undefeated, winning over the greatest teams in every part of the country. One of the stars of those two great teams was halfback Marty Brill, who now lives in Whittier, California. This was in 1929, and uh, that's when I got to know Rockney very well. Uh, Rockney was a great psychologist. Uh, he had a couple of fellows that uh, I was trying to beat out for uh, right halfback, and we would be blocking on the ends, and uh, he would particularly uh, pat the other fellows on the back. For instance, we had a fellow named Manny Kaplan. He'd say, Manny, that's a great block. Whenever I would block, it was never too good. I said, well, you, you should do better. Of course, uh, every time he did this, it made me madder, and he knew that, and I would work harder. So finally, anyway... Uh, I made the team in uh, 1929 and played uh, played varsity, uh, played no, started and finished most of the games in 29 and also played in the 1930 team. 
And I've often been asked, how did Rockney uh, get the team in such a mental condition that they'd go out and win all their games? As a matter of fact, uh, uh, Rockney used to tell us that he uh, wasn't a psychologist, that it was just a matter of common sense. For instance, we were playing uh, Carnegie Tech in 1929 at Pittsburgh. That was the year Rockney had uh, the blood clot in his leg, and he was forbidden by the doctors to be at that game. But against the physician's orders, uh, he got on the train and uh, came to Pittsburgh. Of course, uh, when we were in the dressing room before the game, we didn't even know that Rockney would be there. And uh, just a minute before the game, we were sitting around, uh, as before every game, and everybody was quiet and just sitting on the bench waiting for Tom Lee, the assistant coach, to come in and, and tell us, uh, name the starting lineup and tell us what he wanted us to do. At that moment, they wheeled Rockney in in a wheelchair. And uh, you can imagine the effect it had on we players, uh, not even uh, expecting him there. And uh, a, minute, a minute before the game, they wheeled Rockney in. Now, to give you an example of the psychology that he used, he didn't go into a long speech about uh, do this and do that and do the other thing. All he said was, I didn't come down here with this bad leg to see you lose. Get out there. With that, we practically tore the hinges off the door to getting out on the field, and uh, we won the ball game 7 nothing. It was during Rockney's regime that the Fighting Irish became the favorite team not only of Notre Dame students and alumni but of people in all walks of life everywhere. People who never realized the dream of going to college, and they felt that this was their team, even though they'd never seen a game or visited the campus. They had a fellow by the name of Pete Coyle who sold newspapers in New York. He was just a newspaper boy, and uh, matter of fact, he wasn't a boy. He was about 45 years old. And he was a great idolizer of Notre Dame and Newt Rockney. He idolized Rockney and... He told a Notre Dame alumnus, a prominent Notre Dame alumnus in Newark, that he'd like to just, just see Rockney sometime. So this fellow took him over, and uh, Pete Coyle met Rockney. Rockney talked to him just like he would uh, to the President of the United States. And uh, Rockney says, uh, would you like to take a trip with the team? Well, this was just too much for Pete. Uh, he didn't believe what he was hearing. So Rockney, to show him that he meant it, he took him on the trip when we played uh, Southern California, took him out with the team and uh, treated him just like another member of the team. When Newt Rockney died in 1931, one of his former players, who had also been his assistant coach, became the head coach of Notre Dame for several years. Well, I remember the first time I met him. I come from Calumet, Michigan, which is uh, the copper country, and hadn't been in Chicago before, and changed trains and got on the Grand Trunk and went to South Bend. I got off the train that night and I met George Gipp and Larson and we walked down in front of Holly and Mike's where all the coaches and the players used to stay. And uh, Gipp and Larson introduced me to Rock and he says, what do you play, Hunk? I says, I play fullback. He says, oh, he says, I've got a lot of fullbacks. I need a guard. I said, you're looking at the best guard you ever had. So I started playing guard the next day, and I played four years for him. This is Hartley Anderson, more often called Hunk Anderson, who played on Rockney's first team and helped coach his last team. He's heard or taken part in almost every story about Rockney. Oh, I can remember hundreds of them, but uh, one particular one was... I think it was in 1925 or 6, we were playing Northwestern down at uh, South Bend. And at the halftime, they had us 10 to nothing, and we didn't look very good. So Rock came in the dressing room at the half, and he says, Well, if you fellas are going to play those panty waists unless you push them out of the park, I'm not going to coach you anymore. And he walked out of the dressing room, and all the boys started crying and saying, Did Rock really quit? Did he really quit? So he went out and hit out, and... We started the second half. I took care of him the rest of the time and got him charged up a little bit more, which wasn't necessary, and come out, and after they, they took the kick off, he would come back on the bench from someplace. Nobody knows where he was hiding, and they went out there, and they took the kick off, and they didn't throw a pass, and they marched for seven points, and they held Northwestern on the kickoff, and they went right back down for another seven points, so... It just inspired him to thought that Rock was going to quit, that they really went out and put out for him. 
Joseph M. Byrne, Jr., an attorney in Newark, New Jersey, went to school with Rockne, was graduated in the class of 1915 and is a member of the Board of Trustees of Notre Dame. He and Rockne were friends practically from the first day he stepped on the Notre Dame campus. About 45 years ago, my father brought me to the campus at Notre Dame. And being a little alone there, I made it my business to get around, see what was going on, and the first thing I saw was a small varsity squad playing football, and I was quite attracted by a fellow by the name of Rockne. He was very aggressive, very vigorous, very thorough. At that time, his great play was the onside kick, in which he became an expert in recovery. As I got to know him better and knew him well, because Notre Dame in those days only had 800 students, including prep school and minimums, you got to know putting everybody on the campus worthwhile. And I was amazed that as soon as the football season was over that he went into varsity track on the 220, the 440, the broad jump, the relay, and the pole vault. And some of his records still stand there. But he was never too big for sport because he participated in inner hall athletics and baseball at Notre Dame. But when I got a real good look at him, was when he played in the band, he played the flute, working his way through the university. A lot of people don't know about that, but he was also very active in dramatics, particularly portraying the girl of the Golden West. Absolutely miscast, but still a good ham. As regards his real mentality, he was assistant of professor of chemistry to Father Newland, who was the discoverer of synthetic rubber. Later, when he became head coach at Notre Dame and also director of athletics, I don't know of any fellow that arranged a greater schedule and played everybody, every place, everywhere to the extent that we were nicknamed the Ramblers, which was not very popular with the university. And today and forever, we'll be known as the Fighting Irish. A lot of people don't seem to remember that he was the producer of the only Rose Bowl team we had when we won in 1924 with the Four Horsemen. Despite the fact that he was very ill in his later coaching days, around 1929, with a thrombosis, he never stopped working. He presented innovations in the game, his shift, and his great play, the perfect play, off tackle, that shook men loose at all times. He was a great man in my book, great copy to the press. He went out of his way to give games to other coaches that couldn't make up their schedules, and he helped all his old varsity players get jobs and some of the biggest men in business today. He was a perfectionist. He was marvelous in timing and everything that he did. That was the Newt Rockney that I knew, one of the finest men has ever been my privilege to be associated with. It was in 1924, after 14 years of association with the traditions of Notre Dame, that Newt Rockney joined the Roman Catholic Church. One of his friends in those days was the Reverend Vincent Mooney, now of the Immaculate Conception Church in Kenton, Ohio. The Rockney I knew was delightfully different. Someone very, very special. He loved good books, good music, and he enjoyed the theater. Definitely dynamic, but extremely sensitive. He was nevertheless delightfully human, manifesting in many ways a charming childlike simplicity, despite the publicity and the honors which came to him. Rock overcame a speech defect which militated against him on the platform. And for weeks on end, we spent considerable time at St. Joe Farm near the university rehearsing his speeches. And Rock developed into a colorful after-dinner speaker. Many other incidents come to mind which indicate his depth of character. In 1925, we were going east for the Penn State game. And in order to pass the time in the Pullman, we discussed the possible lineup for that game. I asked him about two particular members of the squad, and he reacted quickly. One of them, he said, is girl crazy, and the other is soft and lazy. And this is their first and their last trip. Moreover, he said, both of them are Catholics, and as I see it, they don't work at it the way they should. Now, just to test his motives, I said I thought it was the responsibility of the clergy to care for the students' spiritual needs, and it was the coach's job to produce a team. Nonsense, Rock said. 
I have played and coached. We have a defense and an offense, and no one questions my interest in that squad. Give a normal coach those ingredients, and he should produce some results. Moreover, he continued, my job here at Notre Dame is quite different. If my influence is limited to the athletic field, then I will fail miserably in reaching my objective as a coach. After all, he said, education is something more than muscle building and treating a charley horse. We cannot ignore the fact that a sane and a balanced program of physical education and athletics has a real place in our schools and colleges. Then Rock concluded, when and if it ever becomes an organized racket, resulting in the exploitation of athletics and athletes, you can say farewell to our athletic programs. It was in March of 1931 when he was looking forward to spring practice again after two undefeated seasons that Rockney took off on a business trip to California. I was the last person to see him in South Bend Alive. I drove with him to the station and he hopped out of the a car and ran. We had an electric line from between South Bend and Chicago, and he was going up there to do a recording for Studebakers. And uh, he hopped out of the car, and he says, I'll see you Friday. And I took his car on home and put it in his garage. He went first to Kansas City to visit his two oldest sons who were in school, and then he went out to the airport and took off for the West Coast. It was a rainy, foggy morning, and the plane disappeared into a dull gray sky. It crashed out on the Kansas Plains, and all eight persons on board were killed, including Newt Rockley, the boy who came from the little town of Voss in Norway, now only 43 years old and a world celebrity. When the news was first flashed, first the rumor and then the confirmation spread quickly over the Notre Dame campus. On March 31st, 1931, Carl Cronin and myself were walking over to the Notre Dame athletic office to pay a visit to one of the assistant coaches, on the way over, when we got about five or ten feet from the office, out walked the captain of the past 1930 team, Tom Connolly, and with him was Dan Halpin, our manager. They told us the news that Rockney had just been killed in an airplane accident. The shock was uh, so great that uh, we just couldn't believe it, and uh, tears filled our eyes. It's hard for me to say just how much that uh, Rockney was loved. Uh, you hear these stories, and uh, you can't believe that a man uh, uh, was loved as much as he was in the Notre Dame campus. And uh, we that played for Rockney uh, know his fine qualities. Uh, the place does, doesn't seem quite uh, the same without him. That's Marty Brill, who was then a youngster still in school. And here's Tom Hickey, his longtime friend and neighbor. Of course, Rock's death was a tremendous shock to me and our family and to all who ever knew him or ever read about him. And my first thought was one of utter loss. If I lost a, a very dear member of our family, I felt that the lights had gone out and it had been a tremendous loss. And, of course, thoughts turned to those who were left. I presume that many, many people wonder what his sweet wife's reaction was to this terrible terrible loss, and of course, it was one of utter loneliness and semi-shock, uh, but of course, the sweet person she was, she felt that her, her faith, her family, her church would carry her through. All over the country, those who had known Rockney and Notre Dame began to hear the news. Where was I when I heard of Rock's death? On that chilly March day, thinking of my wedding day just five days off, I was walking across the campus of the College of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota. Rock had helped me get the job of athletic director and football coach there. He had been guest of honor at a huge welcome dinner for me just two years before on that same campus. When a panting student told me of the news flash, I refused to believe it. So did Father James Galligan, faculty moderator of athletics who had been a lifelong friend of Rock's. It wasn't until he had confirmed the story through local newspaper sources that we did believe it. And even then, we found it impossible to accept, for we refused to think it. Rock couldn't be dead. Not Rock, that bubbling fountain of vitality. Not Rock, with his zest for life, football, and people. Not Rock, at the peak of his coaching career, his third national championship season only recently completed. Not Rock, he 
couldn't be dead. But he was. And slowly, ever so slowly, that completely final thought became convincing. Rock was gone. And with him had gone a part of every life his had touched. That's Joe Boland, who had planned a far different kind of trip back to the campus, a wedding trip, instead of a far different journey. Peg and I had planned our wedding for Monday, April 6th, 1931, in the Log Chapel at Notre Dame, traditional setting for marriages of Notre Dame men. Those plans had been made long before the tragic event of March 31st, when life ended for Rock, who had promised to attend our nuptial mass. Instead, he was to be buried from Sacred Heart Church at Notre Dame on Saturday, April 4th. Hasty plan changes were made, and the three key male figures of the wedding party departed St. Paul together shortly after hearing the grim news. Literally, hundreds of other former Rockney players were traveling to South Bend at that same time, all still stunned by the enormity of the personal loss each man felt. That seemed to be the emotion permeating the entire atmosphere of the city and the university on and after our arrival. A deep sense of personal loss was felt, even among those thousands who had never known Rockney as anything other than a public figure. All through that sad weekend, it seemed as though a part of the heart of everyone who had known Rock was going on that last long journey with him from Sacred Heart Church to Highland Cemetery. That had to be true of Marty Brill, Tom Connolly, Frank Caridio, Margie Schwartz, and those others whose strong young arms helped carry him on that last mile from life. Muscular bodies still in the fine physical condition Rock had caused them to attain as they spearheaded the Irish to the National Collegiate Championship only a few months before. That had to be true of other former players, grizzled in gray or fresh from that title season of 1930, who packed the pews of Sacred Heart Church and listened and agreed, as Father Charles O'Donnell, poet president of the university, described the Rockney they had loved so well as a go-giver in an age of the go-getter. That had to be particularly true of Bonnie Rockney and Bill and Jean and Canute Jr. and Jackie, the family loved so well by the man now gone, most certainly far more than just a part of their hearts, went with them. And so three days later in that little log chapel at Notre Dame, when Peg and I turned from the altar where we had just started our lives together, it was like having Rock himself there to find Bonnie Rockney kneeling near the aisle. As Bonnie said then... Canute would have wanted it this way. Students, alumni, and friends gathered from everywhere to pay tribute at his funeral. One of them was Frank Leahy, then a student, who was to become one day the coach at Notre Dame himself. Newt Rockney, the man, was perfectly described by Father Charles O'Donnell, president of Notre Dame in 1931, as he delivered his eulogy at Rock's funeral. A eulogy which shall be remembered forever. I'll always remember that talk. His words made an indelible impression upon me as I sat in St. Mary's Church on the campus at Notre Dame. Father O'Donnell said, This week there has occurred a tragic event. Newt Rockney is dead. And who was he? Asked the President of the United States, who dispatched a personal note of tribute. Asked the King of Norway, the state legislature, the university senates, the civic bodies, Ask the bishops, clergymen, ask the thousands of newspaper men whose labor of love and his memory has stirred a reading public of 125 million Americans. Ask men and women from every walk of life. Ask the children, the boys of America. Yes, ask all of these. Who was this man whose death has struck the nation with dismay and everywhere bowed heads in grief? This was Newt Rockney. This has been a biography in sound, They Knew Rockney, an impression of New Rockney created by the voices of those who knew him. The program was prepared by Jack C. Wilson and Alan Ludden. Your commentator is Kenneth Banghart.